Fox's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, right. About that. Well, reward would be slimming, slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, right? yeah, okay. Yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The cross. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. The number of COVID-19 cases here in Georgia continues to rise. Right now, there are over 1,300 confirmed cases in 97 counties. 47 people have died. And now, multiple counties have issued a state of emergency, hoping to contain the spread of the virus. Johns Hopkins University out of Baltimore is now reporting over 450,000 cases worldwide. The United States now is in the top three. China has by far the most cases, more than 80,000. Italy has more than 74,000 cases, but has the most deaths of any other country with a little over 7,500. I'm Jeff Hollinger. And I'm Jennifer Bellamy in the 11 Alive studio today. The governor said in a one on one call with 11 Alive that he believes the coronavirus may have been in our state long before the first cases were officially reported here. The more testing we do, the more positives we're going to see. And it's, it's for several reasons. Number one, people already had this disease over a month ago in our state. Uh, there's some, and, and I'm one of them, that believes this virus has been here since potentially December or early January. All of this in perspective, Hartsfield Jackson told us on January 21st it would begin screening passengers on flights originating from China amid the growing outbreak overseas. In late February, airports began screening other international travelers. And on March 2nd, we learned a father and his 15 year old son had tested positive in Fulton County, the first cases in our state. The father had returned about a week before from Italy, but said he didn't feel sick until several days later. The governor says the state has been working on this 24 seven ever since with the number of cases continuing to grow. People are mourning the death now of a local high school coach and teacher. His family says he died yesterday just days after testing positive for COVID-19. She knew her reports. His family now has a plea for people about doing everything necessary to stop the spread of the virus. The way Kendria Hill describes her father, Ron Hill, most who know him agree. Daddy is a fun, loving, no nonsense kind of man. Nikki Williams Rucker worked with Hill at the Mount Vernon school where he taught and coached. She says he was someone the kids looked up to. The kids know that if Coach Hill is in the classroom, do not. <laughs> it's not for play play. You know, he loved them. He was loved too, especially by Kendria, who pulled so hard for him to fight through when he was in the hospital this week. As selfish as I am and I want my daddy here, I just had to be like, Daddy, it's okay. You can go. You put up a fight. You can't do it anymore. Your kids are going to be okay. 
Your grandkids are going to be okay. Kindria says her father was in the hospital for pneumonia, but then tested positive for COVID-19. Just days later, he died. He had to be in the hospital by himself with no family around. So we just had to stand there at that glass and say our goodbyes through a glass door. The Mount Vernon School said in a statement, Ron Hill was a longtime beloved teacher and coach at the Mount Vernon School. His passing is an incredible loss for our community, impacting so many of us. Kindria says with this tragedy, she wants people to know the serious impacts of the coronavirus and to be mindful of social distancing. If you don't have to be out, please, please, please stay at home. You know, you don't think of these things until it hits close to home and you realize how serious this is. It's not a joke. And at this point, the governor has no plans to issue a statewide shelter in place order, but there are a number of other communities all around North Georgia that have opted to do that for themselves. The basic outlines are the same. If it's non-essential travel or non-essential business, you need to stay indoors. But they vary greatly when it comes to parks. We've seen that in Atlanta with the Beltline. Cobb County is now among the strictest, and Commissioner Mike Boyce told 11 Alive's uh, Doug Richards that he is going to double down on all of this. Terrell Mill Park in Cobb County had a very user unfriendly stretch of yellow tape at its entrance today. And yet it didn't stop folks accustomed to using the park from continuing to do so, despite an order from the county closing Cobb's 44 parks. Cobb Chairman Mike Boyce says the county closed the parks because its users last weekend weren't staying socially distant. For instance, in the pavilions in the parks, right? People were, were gathering in large groups in the pavilions. Boyce told us he drove past Terrell Mill Park himself today and saw people disregarding the county's order to stay out. What we're doing is in your best interest. If you choose to ignore those and we do not get the desired effect from the state of emergency, I can assure you we will, we will double down on our restrictions here to ensure that people comply with the six-foot guidelines and no more than ten. Cobb County's restrictions came at around the same time the city of Atlanta issued its own restrictions while pointedly exempting the popular Atlanta Beltline and other city parks from the restrictions. The mayor said Monday there was a reason. This isolation period it is still going to be important for mental and physical health reasons. Yet even that's debatable. I run on the Beltline, the East Side Trail, uh, Piedmont Park. Francesca Flores is a wellness coach who says she has all but stopped exercising on the Beltline and in Atlanta parks because its patrons aren't respecting social distance guidelines designed to slow the COVID-19 pandemic. She thinks, like Cobb County, the city should close its parks. Because people aren't following um, the recommended procedures, I think even if it's for a week, that they should shut down the parks, unfortunately, um, because if it's not mandated, people are going to continue doing it and not following the social distancing. And Flores thinks the city should close down the Beltline only for a week, just to send a message to the patrons that the coronavirus is serious business. And we know this is a subject so many people have such a myriad of divergent opinions on. We want to know what you think. We want to get your view if this is the right call or if it is perhaps too much. You can vote in our poll right now, and the numbers are very interesting to see what the reaction has been so far as we did this during our earlier broadcast today. Here's Liza Lucas with some of the reaction that we have gotten so far. We've seen hundreds of you sharing this update from Cobb County. Many of you also tagging your friends on our Facebook page and sharing your reaction to the news. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, so we want to highlight some of the points we're seeing. Susan, among those questioning the impact of Cobb County's order. Since the declaration states that non-essential businesses can still operate between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. On the other side of the conversation, praise for Cobb County officials. And similar to what we saw when the city of Atlanta's shelter in place was announced, some of you continue to call for a statewide mandate in action from Governor Brian Kemp. As a reminder, the social distancing and shelter in place orders are all an effort to flatten the curve. Since coronavirus spreads through person to person contact, experts believe if we distance ourselves from others and stay out of big crowds, we could spread new cases out over a longer period of time, basically buying time for our doctors and nurses to treat those who need help. 
And the coronavirus has impacted the lives of so many. Our Joe Hinkey spoke with a local business owner searching for ways to make ends meet and continue to pay her employees. The key advice I heard today is apply now. Emergency loan applications for businesses on both the local and federal level are already piling up and they're being handled on a first come first serve basis. Courtney Didi owns DOG Pet Services and Training and employs 25 people. We made the decision that we needed to be part of the solution instead of the problem. Didi closed her business to follow Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms 14 day stay at home order and is now piecing together loans to stay afloat. As much as I don't want to take on any more debt at this point it's about taking care of my clients, continuing a business that I've had for 10 years and keeping my team employed. DDI applied for financial help from two sources. First, Invest Atlanta. $1.5 million in emergency loans from the city are being offered to businesses. Atlanta businesses can receive a loan of $5,000 to $30,000 with 0% interest and payments deferred for up to a year. Invest Atlanta CEO Dr. Eloisa Clementich says that they already have 150 plus applications. We understand in this time we have to act, act fast and be there to support our businesses to preserve our jobs. Clementich says the first checks could be sent out as quickly as next Wednesday. An Invest Atlanta survey of 112 small businesses found 87% already have sluggish sales. 74% say they are financially unprepared for this crisis. So these type of funds are going to be essential to ensure that they're able to survive this crisis and continue to exist and providing us services when this is over. The second item DDI applied for a small business administration disaster loan. The SBA offering loans of up to $2 million. Businesses need credit acceptable to the SBA. First payments are due in one year. The SBA is stressing apply now to get help as quickly as possible. But we've never had a nationwide disaster declaration such as this. Uh, all states have now been declared and Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. So this is unprecedented territory. Most businesses have taken a huge blow, especially airlines. We have seen Delta cut capacity by 70%. There are times during the day the airport, long known for being the busiest in the world, looks virtually empty. Atlanta City Council member Jennifer Ide says they just received an update from Hartsville Jackson's general manager. He told them passenger volume is down 85% with flights down 65%. The silver lining for the airport, cargo business is going up. Right now, the federal aid package includes $500 billion in aid for corporations, including airlines. Information about coronavirus is coming in fast. The easiest way to stay up to date is to download the 11 Alive News app. We'll send you alerts right to your phone. Well, these are extraordinary times and it demands extraordinary action. And all of the media outlets in Atlanta Metro have all uh, been galvanized together as we are coming together. And we're going to uh, share with all of the viewers all across Georgia this, uh, this uh, very interesting town hall with Governor Kemp. It's going to be a simulcast, and we are proud here at 11 Alive to be part of that. You can see it here on WATL, the Big 36, and on our sister station, 11 Alive, and of course, 11alive.com will have all of it as well. And if you have questions for the governor and a panel of experts, including Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, you can text them to us at the number on your screen, 404-885-7600. Remember, don't call and say, hey, I want to talk to the governor. I want to talk to the mayor. You can talk to them, but it has to be via text, so don't forget about that. She was told her test results would be back in three days, but now she is on day nine and still doesn't know if she has coronavirus. We're checking in with her next. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they yeah. didn't wait the next week. Ah. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Live's Chesley McNeil. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. 
Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then why A Brazelton woman says she still doesn't know whether or not she has coronavirus. She says she was told she'd have results in 24 to 72 hours, but she and others she was in contact with are still waiting. Owen Lopez spoke with her today. You are dealing with, you know, 10, 15, 20 people that I came in contact with that are out there that have no idea whether they are COVID-19 positive or negative. It's been nine days since Rosa Santiago Zimmerman says she was tested for COVID-19 curbside at North Georgia Urgent Care in Brazelton. Today, she still doesn't know whether she has the novel virus. The 49-year-old with no underlying medical condition says she's been feeling sick for three weeks now, and it all started during a Florida business trip. I just have this hacking cough and sometimes this cough will last for like 30 seconds where I'm just coughing, coughing, coughing and the burning sensation in my lungs. Now she remains in self quarantine with her husband and daughter who also have been showing symptoms. I was told that they cannot be tested until my results come in. On Monday, she says she got a call saying her test results came in as negative, but then another call saying that wasn't the case. My physician called me back to tell me that they had made a mistake, that my results were pending and had not arrived yet. Now she's in limbo. We keep on talking about let's flatten this curve. Well, we can't flatten the curve if we don't have the information to flatten the curve. National health officials say that the U.S. is seeing more cases of COVID-19 in people between the ages of 20 and 54, and here in our state, the Department of Public Health says 60% of cases are within the 18 to 59 age range. 35% are over 60, and the majority of deaths in Georgia are those over the age of 60. And here we are as we continue to learn more and more about coronavirus, learning about the symptoms. And it would seem that in many cases, uh, there are a flurry of symptoms that have been somewhat surprising. For instance, some patients have moderate symptoms for about a week and then they get better. Conversely, other patients are having mild symptoms for about a week and they suddenly get worse. Here's NBC's Joe Fryer. He has more for us tonight. For some patients, doctors say the first phase of COVID-19 is more like a slow burn with moderate symptoms for several days, even a week before things rapidly go downhill. Similar to the experience of Congressman Ben McAdams, who spoke with Today last Thursday. I'm feeling pretty bad. I think this is probably the worst cold I've ever had, but you're getting by. Over the first six days of McAdams' illness, his symptoms included a cough, fever, and shortness of breath. My lungs were really constricted. I uh, felt like I had a belt around my chest. And so I but on Friday, a day after this interview, and, uh, McAdams was hospitalized, saying, I experienced severe shortness of breath and struggled to maintain my blood oxygen at appropriate levels. He says he's now feeling relatively better. In addition to the well-known coronavirus symptoms, fever, cough, headache, and shortness of breath, doctors now say some patients may lose their sense of smell and taste. Utah jazz player Rudy Gobert, who tested positive tweeted haven't been able to smell anything for the last four days experts say if that happens and if it's your only symptom and you don't have allergies call your doctor that does seem to be a little bit more of a common thread that i think was underappreciated initially Dr. Keith Mortman at George Washington University Hospital stresses everyone, even young people, needs to take coronavirus seriously. He made this video showing the extent of damage done to the lungs of an actual 59-year-old patient who's in critical condition with COVID-19. 
This is not the common flu. This is not your garden variety pneumonia. This is something that we have not seen or experienced before, and we all have to do our part, and we all have to take it seriously. Dr. Mortman says it's still way too early to know the long-term damage caused by coronavirus, even in younger patients. Pollen count today going back up, and I hope if you're working inside, you at least got a chance to sit at a window and look outside to see the sunshine and maybe step outside to enjoy it a little bit. If you didn't mind breathing in some of those pollen particles, the pollen count for today is back up to 664. The main pollens present are pine, sweet gum, oak, willow, and mulberry. Uh, the grasses are on the low end. Weeds aren't really an issue right now, but the mold is on the high end too, thanks to all the rain that we've been dealing with in our area. And if you're looking for trends in the pollen count, you can see that it was 2462 on Sunday, and then it was down to 594, thanks to the cooler air and some of the rain that we had around. Tuesday, really low at 19, thanks to the rain that we had from Monday into Tuesday. But now it's back up to 664, and that trend is gonna continue of going up because we're entering into a drier pattern now and a warmer pattern, and that's just gonna make those pollens really start to kind of explode out there and grow. So here's what we're gonna be watching as we go through uh, the next uh, few hours here and into tomorrow morning. Temperatures starting in the low 50s, and at lunchtime, we're moving up into the low 60s, and then by afternoon, Topping off, this model saying in the mid-70s, I think we're going to be a little bit higher than that, getting up to about 78 degrees for a high temperature, and then we cool down again. Really comfortable temperatures Thursday evening, and then Friday, we warm up even more into the 80s. So here's a look at the uh, forecast as we go into tomorrow at 10 on the wasometer, a low of 52, and a high of 78 degrees mostly sunny skies. It is going to be a really nice day out there. Here's the forecast track, and we're not really seeing a lot of activity on the forecast track. That's a good thing. Tonight, it's going to be quiet. Tomorrow, we're going to see mostly sunny skies to start. This is at 7 o'clock. We will see a few clouds, though, over to the east of us, trying to mix in around lunchtime, mixing in with those clouds at times, but that's not going to give us any rain. They break up quickly. We'll see mostly sunny skies again into the afternoon. The evening looking great into Thursday, and then as we continue through the the rest of the period here, you're going to see that the conditions are still going to be nice into Friday as well with partly cloudy skies moving through the area and those temperatures really nice and warm. So here's the seven day outlook, mostly sunny Thursday, a couple of more clouds possible on Friday with highs near 84. We're going to stick with tens on the wasometer for both of those days and then turning mostly cloudy on Saturday, a high of 83, scattered showers developing on Sunday, dry on Monday. Then showers developing again on Tuesday, a little better chance for that on Wednesday with high temperatures trending back down into the 60s. All right, Chris, thank you. When it comes to sports, there is so much uncertainty right now. I mean, you, you pick a sport and you're talking about the unknown, whether it's the NFL or Major League Baseball, the NBA, hockey, golf, and certainly the AJC Peachtree Road Race as well. When you talk about so many people in such close quarters, Running the 10K on the 4th of July, you worry, you wonder, and you want more information. Alex Glaze has that covered for you tonight as he talks with the AJC Peachtree Road Race Director, Rich Canal. The Atlanta Track Club is preparing for the 51st running of the Peachtree Road Race, but this year the planning process has been different. Our staff is getting intimately familiar with Google Hangout. There are roughly 35 people working on the plan for the Peachtree, and all of them are following the recommendations and guidelines the city of Atlanta has in place to fight the coronavirus. The Atlanta Track Club is planning full steam ahead with the understanding that things might not go as planned. There is nothing off the table uh, in our planning process for 2020. In these times of uncertainty, uh, we have to plan for everything. Planning for everything includes postponement and cancellation of the race. In the previous 50 consecutive runnings of the Peachtree, there has never been a cancellation or postponement. The race has always happened on the 4th of July. This year, with health and safety on the minds of almost everybody, the most important thing is ensuring that everything is safe for the world's largest 10K. Our mission is about health and fitness. Um, so we won't have this event uh, if there's any doubt of, about our ability to deliver it in, in a safe manner on July 4th.
King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film Hawks Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on The Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, and Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Auntie. No. <laughs> Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know if you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personal. In America, more than 60,000 people are confirmed to have the coronavirus, with that number expected to continue climbing. The U.S. death toll was at 802 early today after passing 600 on Tuesday. And now a growing number of states and counties across the nation are cracking down on residents' movements. That's more than 100 million Americans ordered to stay home. Jay Gray reports. It's hard not to be happy with the job we're doing. President Trump lauding his administration's response to the coronavirus pandemic and continuing his push for a quick return to business as usual. It's going to open up uh, like a rocket ship. I think it's going to go very good and very quickly. Right now, though, communities across the country are facing a more immediate challenge. As concern grows over the manpower and resources available to fight the outbreak, more than 60,000 Americans sick, more than 800 dead. Tragic numbers expanding much faster than initially expected. The increase is absolutely staggering, and we know that we're really at the beginning of this. Case numbers are increasing on a daily basis, and soon our hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. Many on the front lines of the fight are already overwhelmed. First responders not only overworked, but falling ill. We're currently at about 3,200 members on the uniform side um, out sick. Okay. Uh, it's about triple the rate that we normally see. In New York, the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak, the governor calling on retired medical professionals to come back for reserve duty. God bless them, 40,000 people have signed up as a surge health care force. 2,000 physicians, anesthesiologists, emergency room technicians, nurse practitioners. Similar teams will be needed around the clock and across the country as the battle against the virus intensifies. Each day we wake up, we see the coronavirus is taking a major toll on our day to day lives. Now, a former regional director of FEMA says this pandemic is the largest disaster our nation has ever faced. We're going to hear more from him next. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings, what you want? 
isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Lil Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. We vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they are fun. And they're, they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel like thing. we have to evolve with the times, though. The number of COVID-19 cases here in Georgia continues to rise. Right now, there are over 1,300 confirmed cases in 97 counties. 47 people have died. And now multiple counties have issued a state of emergency, hoping to contain the spread of the virus. Johns Hopkins University now reporting over 450,000 cases worldwide. The United States has risen to the top three. China has by far the most cases, more than 80,000 at this point. Italy has more than 74,000 cases, but has the most deaths of any other country with a little over 7,500. Updates on coronavirus are coming in very quickly. It can be very hard to keep track of it all. So here on the ATL, we are committed to bringing you the latest information all three hours of primetime and on 11 uh, Atlanta's only 7 p.m. newscast. So here are a few things that you may have missed. MARTA is suspending bus fares starting tomorrow. It's one way to protect the health of employees. Riders will enter and exit through the rear doors of the bus, except for riders who need to use accessibility ramp. Because the fare boxes are at the front of the bus, the agency is suspending those fares. MARTA will also close some public restrooms. Numbers yesterday compared to a month ago show bus and rail ridership are both down by more than 50 percent. UGA plans to start issuing refunds to students on Monday. The school says since students were more than halfway through the semester, it is refunding 46% of some costs like athletic, recreation, and transportation fees, plus portions of housing and dining payments. But it says based on guidance from the University System of Georgia, it won't refund tuition or certain fees like technology fees. It is a red alert at Waffle House. The Georgia chain has declared a Waffle House index red as it closes a fifth more than a fifth of its restaurants. Waffle House locations usually remain open 24 seven and are some of the only places that won't close during severe weather and other national uh, natural disasters. 
But right now, because of coronavirus, it has closed 418 locations. The former Southeast Regional Director of FEMA says the coronavirus is the largest disaster we have ever faced as a nation. He told our Caitlin Ross is going to require the entire nation pulling together to get past it. This kind of a disaster, a biomedical disaster, is a different kind of a disaster. John Copenhaver responded to hurricanes, tornadoes and wildfires during his time at FEMA under President Clinton's administration, but says he never dealt with anything like COVID-19. The president named FEMA as the lead response agency. It needs to be really FEMA working very, very closely with the National Institutes for Health, the Centers for Disease Control and uh, medical authorities. He thinks the response needs to be more unified than what we see now in Georgia, with different cities and counties declaring their own individual state of emergencies, which can widely vary. If one area effectively responds, but other areas that are within a certain geographical distance don't, then you could have a, a problem with people coming to the area that didn't respond as effectively into the area that managed to, con to somewhat contain the virus and starting the cycle all over again. He thinks the United States should learn from countries that got the virus under control quickly, like South Korea, where they had more immediate widespread testing and isolating people who are sick. Since March 11th, they've seen a general decline in new cases. What did they do and do effectively? Copenhaver believes the United States response now will be effective, though it may have taken too long to get here. Lag time in between things getting worse, which has happened so quickly with this virus, and the spin up of, of government operations to be able to respond is causing some degree of fear and frustration but they need to know that there really are world-class people that are a part of this response effort. One of the challenges for so many families has been trying to shepherd your kids in the right way to make sure that they're structured, to make sure that they have certainly uh, their best interests are being served by time management. It's hard to do if you're a parent. You know, you become an employee, you become a therapist, you become a coach. And most importantly, you become a teacher. Rebecca Lindstrom spent some time with some mothers who are figuring out this whole new norm. Comprehensive worksheet. We met Ashley Mahoney's family on the first week schools closed. Life seemed pretty well under control. The most challenging right now is making sure that by the end of the week, we still have the same momentum. By week two, momentum remains intact, but the challenges of getting stuff done are more apparent, like the three-year-old running in the background, turning on and off the lights. It's given this mom a valuable lesson. Accepting that it's not going to be perfect and learning to roll with punches. Mahoney says her son is diligent about his homework, but it doesn't all make it to the teachers. Connor's concerned. Worrying about getting bad grades. Can you tell her? Mahoney has worries too. She's had to step away from at least one important web meeting for work. Cece had just had enough. And, you know, she wouldn't sit. She was crying. She, I mean, she, she was done. When I asked Mahoney how she was feeling. Trying to be upbeat for my kids. That look really says it all, and it's about the same look I got from this mom. My oldest and that's Courtney Gibbs has a seven-year-old son with special needs. Aiden is pre-verbal. He's just learning to talk and doesn't really understand what's going on. He went from having a very busy schedule, school all day, and then therapy after school. And we were doing seven therapies a week. That's now down to three. So it goes. Gibbs hopes those programs are able to stay open. She needs the support and Aiden needs the interaction. We are seeing some behavior that we have not seen in a very long time come back. Some aggression. Gibbs tries to keep him busy with the things he loves. <laughs> Disney music, playing outdoors. It's tough for him to sit down and focus on a computer-based lesson. And her older son? He is an IEP as well. So he's running around, he's loud, he's happy. And then my oldest is upstairs like, Mom, I need help. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And I'm like, I don't know what to do, you know, because I feel like I'm being pulled in every direction. Despite the challenges, both moms say the time with their children is priceless. You know, maybe incorporate some cooking or, you know, just more talks. And, you know, because, I, you know, we'd never have time for just those simple things. And there have been successes too. He's been able to 
potty train in our house. This is a huge deal. I've heard from a lot of parents that it's the uncertainty that is really the hardest part, not knowing just what to tell your kids. And these moms say they certainly agree. COVID-19 is forcing the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra to temporarily shut down. The doors of Symphony Hall will be closed through May 11th. Business operations will move online and musicians will play for the public through online platforms like Facebook Watch. 11 Live spoke with executive director Jennifer Barlamet. She says while maintaining an online presence is key, the cancellation of live performances forces the symphony to lose millions. We've lost already millions of dollars in revenue from the concerts that we had previously um, had to cancel. And um, you know, the value of the endowment has been reduced as has everyone's um, invested funds. We've been here for, we've been here for many years. We'll be here for many more with the support of the community. Um, but there's really no way to um, overstate how, how incredibly devastating this is for the institution financially. Well, if you have a ticket to a canceled show, organizers are asking that you donate its value back to the orchestra. And although this season has been canceled, the symphony is excited for next season, which will be dedicated to the retirement of musical director and conductor Robert Spano. Yeah, the situation for the symphony is a little bit like Atlanta sports teams as well. You know, you kind of look forward to the next season. That's about the only thing that you can do at this point, that it's devastating what we have been through and potentially what we are on our way to going through. It seems like everybody wants to help. And this is a story of a woman who wanted to do something, wanted to take word in action. And she did exactly that using as a tool the Chick-fil-A chicken sandwiches, nearly 500 of them. And they were all given to health professionals on the front line of the pandemic. ago that we should go to Chick-fil-A and take some sandwiches to some of our local hospitals. It all came from me feeling really overwhelmed and scared and wanting to help people. People started sharing it on social media and it just took on a life of its own, really. Friends, we're at Northside Hospital. We're about to load up all the Chick-fil-A sandwiches and take them inside. So let's see what we find. Because I'm up to almost 500 sandwiches. Wow. At first, I think we're just bringing them like a couple meals, you know, but when then they see it's hundreds of sandwiches. They have just been so appreciative. And All right, friends, that is a wrap for our Chick-fil-A delivery. Thanks so much for coming along with us. Uh, thank you for everybody that donated your points. You just uh, be kind to each other and help each other. You know, it's not that hard to love your neighbor like yourself. All right, coming up, as the coronavirus spreads, Wall Street is trying everything it can to stay afloat. Coming up, a financial expert's advice on how you can ensure that your finances stay untouched. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they yeah. didn't wait the next week. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta. Almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. 
From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on The Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And, of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. The Dow Jones ended trading today with its second straight day of gains up nearly 500 points, but there's still a lot of uncertainty for millions of Americans when it comes to finances as we wait for a possible stimulus bill to pass in Congress. In the meantime, we asked local financial expert Andrew Poulos for some tips on how to help our personal budgets right now. Uh, the big question you should be asking yourself right now is do you need it or do you want it if you don't if it's something that you want versus need i would cut out and only focus on the needs twenty dollars here fifty dollars there all starts making a uh, impact to the bottom line if you are not on uh, budget billing with your utilities with georgia power uh, or gas provider call them up see if you can get on a budget billing to be able to track and know how much you will pay as far as your uh, your utilities each month so you're on a fixed plan in a sense and you can predict what your cost is going to be for the next couple of months to be able to live uh, if you have savings or an emergency fund now is the time to begin uh, to use that well, we have more on how you can get financial help during this is a, a very stressful time for many of us. You can find that information on 11alive.com. Grocery store staffers play a vital part in helping us get food on the table and the supplies that we need. But how are they managing and what can we do to ensure that everybody is safe when they are shopping? It is estimated that more than three million people work in the grocery business all across the United States. And uh, right now, in addition to our health care workers, they are certainly at risk as they are dealing with the public in a very, very close quarters, and so many people are coming through their lines. Here's NBC's Vicki Wynn with more on their plight. In the midst of shutdowns and social distancing, grocery store clerks are seeing a sustained spike in demand as shoppers stock up for a pandemic. Sales have gone up tremendously, and uh, customers are just coming in and buying up uh, product at unseen levels. Jared Labar usually works in the corporate office for King Supermarkets, but now he's in stores helping to restock. Is there anything that people can do to help all of these workers who are on the front lines? The biggest thing for us is, the, you know, just make sure that they are adhering to the social distancing. To keep that distance and protect workers from the constant flow of customers, Albertsons, HEB, and Kroger are installing plexiglass shields in the checkout line. Just remember that we're human beings too, and we have feelings, and yeah, just take care of us too, because we're taking care of them. Workers asking customers to be patient and understanding when items are sold out. Despite assurances that the supply chain is working, some stores continue to report gaps in what they normally provide. We are actually out of ground turkey at the moment. Still, essential items are available thanks to staff providing some normalcy during an abnormal time. Somebody's got to be here. I mean, people need food. There's some things you can live without. Food is not one of them. And on social media, a flood of appreciation in the form of art like this. Workers hailed as heroes and thanked by many for being brave. This banner hung across the street from a store in Brooklyn. Thanks for the groceries. We love you. 
they're really awesome. And to be here, like during this time, during this time period where it's really tough, it, it takes a brave person. With data showing the average grocery store worker makes $29,000 a year, these staffers are working overtime to provide basic services to keep society running. Well, I don't consider myself a hero. Karen, a cashier from New Jersey, tells us she's just doing her job. It's our job to make sure that you have what you need. So next time you see your cashier, just say thank you. It means a lot. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. What a great day we had out there today. After all the rain that we had yesterday and the storms last night, we cleared out very nicely today. Even though we started off with a few clouds this morning, those clouds were able to break up. And we made it up to 73 for a high temperature this afternoon. That is above where we should be. We should be around 67 for this time of year. So a really nice day out there with all that sunshine coming through. And that's what helped us to warm us up a little bit more. Now, we picked up a little bit more than a half inch of rain. That was mainly during the overnight hours last night into early this morning, and then we dried out for the rest of the day. So that half inch that you see was mainly while most people were sleeping out there this morning. So here's what we're going to be watching as we go through the evening hours. Temperatures falling from the 60s into the 50s. With the clear skies, it's going to cool down uh, pretty quickly here. So we will drop from the 70s into the 50s late evening, and then not falling too much overnight. We'll be in the low 50s to start off early in the morning. Uh, and then we warm up really nicely as we go through the day. In fact, we're seeing that pattern change as finally we have a dry streak in store for us. Temperatures will be getting warmer. We're going to be in the upper 70s here for tomorrow. And then as we move into Friday and Saturday, temperatures in the 80s. So it's going to be feeling really nice out there. And then the weekend isn't going to be totally dry, but it's also not going to be a washout as we're going to have a quick moving system move in that will give us some rain. We think that'll be on Sunday morning. So here's the wasometer for you. This is for tomorrow a 10, a low of 52 degrees and a high of 78, mostly sunny skies. Now I have some people saying, wouldn't that be an 11? Well, it's so far above the average. It's not quite a perfect day for this time of year, but it's close, but that's why we're giving it a 10. Here you can see the forecast track, dry weather conditions out there tonight, mainly clear skies. Starting off in the morning, watch the time frame here. You can see us in the morning with mostly sunny skies. We will watch a few clouds that'll be over on the east side that'll try to move in around lunchtime, mixing in with the sun. It's not gonna be a total overcast and it's not gonna be there all day. Look how that disappears once we get into the afternoon hours. And then as you can see here, looking great as we go into Friday morning, a couple of additional clouds will mix in on Friday. We'll call it partly cloudy skies during the day Friday. With those temperatures though, getting into the 80s for both Friday and also into Saturday. So a 10 on the wasometer Thursday at 78. A couple of more clouds Friday and 84. 83 Saturday with even more clouds building in. And then some showers on Sunday scattered around. A break on Monday. Notice how we cool back down into the 70s. And then 30% chance for showers Tuesday. 50% chance on Wednesday with temperatures moving back into the 60s once again. As COVID-19 spreads, doctors say they are running out of those critical face masks. Now people across the nation are opting to make them at home, but are they still effective? Our Verify team has the answer next. Only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. 
So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm gonna go ahead and retire. <laughs> It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food in the corner. With a shortage of masks continuing, many of you have asked us about making your own at home. And we had our Verify team look into this subject because there are so many questions and the need is so great, as we all know. Do they work? That's what we want to know. Here is Jason Puckett. Viewer Ann P. sent us a question about making protective masks. She'd seen instructions online and wanted to know if they worked. And Ann is definitely not alone. There are a lot of articles about this right now. So let's break this down. Can you make your own masks? Do they work? And when should you even be wearing a mask? Our sources, the WHO and CDC. So one reason this question is gaining steam online is that people are posting patterns and encouraging others to make the masks. This Forbes article says, quote, if you think that handmade masks can't be used, think again. Even the CDC has a place for them in times of crisis like the one we're in right now. So this is technically true, but it needs some context. The CDC does have a page dedicated to optimizing the supply of face masks. They have different recommendations based on conventional, contingency, and crisis situations. And all the way at the bottom of the page, below crisis situations, there's an important point about using homemade masks. The CDC says these should be a last resort, only used with other protective measures, and that their ability to protect healthcare workers is unknown. Basically, the CDC says they don't know if homemade masks are effective and should only be used when nothing else is available. The WHO agrees with that. They say that medical masks should only be worn if you're caring for a sick person or if you yourself are coughing or sneezing. WHO guidelines say that cloth masks, like cotton or gauze, are not recommended under any circumstances. And most of home patterns call for using cloth of some sort. So we can verify, neither the CDC or WHO recommend using homemade masks. Got any other questions? Send us an email. He was a teacher, coach, and a mentor. Tonight, a local man's family says he lost his life after testing positive for the coronavirus. New on Primetime, his daughter explains what put him in the hospital in the first place. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. right, right. about I mean, that. Reward would be... Slimming, Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, 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 okay. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyn Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta.
The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jax, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Cross Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel as good vibe when you vibe with it. It's a good time. We don't worry about that hate. We just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're going to get here. And that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. It's a reality many couples have had to come to terms with in recent weeks due to the spread of the coronavirus postponing their wedding. But that didn't stop one couple from exchanging vows virtually. Athens native Judd Poole and his fiance Lindsay Ruth Schultz were supposed to be married in a month, but due to social distancing, they were going to have to cancel their plans for the big day. So instead, they took their nuptials to Facebook Live. Me and my mom and my sister were driving around town looking for just somewhere to get married. We found a place and I drove to Judd's work and I said, hey, you want to get married tomorrow? We thought, you know, there's a lot of people that don't get to be here, so why don't we just make it a Facebook Live wedding so that all those people can be here? And it just kind of sparked from there. A lot more people were able to, to attend and actually kind of be Than would have even been able to be there. Right, than would have been there originally. They weren't there physically, but they were there. They shared in that moment. Well, whatever it takes, congratulations to the happy couple. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We got attacked today today. We're going to have to do it again tomorrow. I can promise you that we have been doing that 24 7 for the last 32 days. This is the 32nd day since I first heard the word coronavirus and had to start dealing with this. We're going to do that for however long it takes to get our state through this. We'll be better on the other side of it. Well, you just heard from him. Uh, we spoke with the governor, Brian Kemp, today. He says that COVID-19 is airborne now. Social distancing is so crucial for all of us here in Georgia. Uh, more people are complying. He says mobility of the state is down 40 percent as a lot of folks stay at home. Testing is now expanding. However, it's still a big challenge for all of us here. And we're going to have more on that coming up on 11 Alive at 11 o'clock on Uplink. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Ron Jones. I'm reporting from home, just like a lot of us here at 11 Alive, to make sure not only that we're safe, but that we can get the information to you to keep your family safe. And tonight, the number of coronavirus cases in the United States, very startling. It has now surpassed 62,000. So let's get to our state. Here are the latest numbers here in Georgia. 1,387 confirmed cases of those 438 are hospitalized. 47 people have already died as of this evening. Fulton, DeKalb, Doherty, and Cobb counties have the highest number of cases, each with more than 100 cases, accounting for about 40% of the total cases here in Georgia. So with that, people are mourning the death of a local high school coach and teacher. His family says that he died yesterday just days after testing positive for COVID-19. So they have a message for all of us to adhere to what the authorities are saying about stopping that spread. 11 Alive's Chanu Her spoke with him. The way Kendria Hill describes her father, Ron Hill, most who know him agree. Daddy is a fun, loving, no nonsense kind of man. Nikki Williams Rucker worked with Hill at the Mount Vernon school where he taught and coached. She says he was someone the kids looked up to. The kids know that if Coach Hill is in the classroom, do not, <laughs> it's not for play play. You know, he loved them. He was loved too, especially by Kendria, who pulled so hard for him to fight through when he was in the hospital this week. As selfish as I am and I want my daddy here, I just had to be like, Daddy, it's okay, you can go. You put up a fight, you can't do it anymore. Your kids are gonna be okay. Your grandkids are gonna be okay. Kendria says her father was in the hospital for pneumonia, but then tested positive for COVID-19. 
just days later, he died. He had to be in the hospital by himself with no family around. So we just had to stand there at that glass and say our goodbyes through a glass door. The Mount Vernon School said in a statement, Ron Hill was a longtime beloved teacher and coach at the Mount Vernon School. His passing is an incredible loss for our community, impacting so many of us. Kindria says with this tragedy, she wants people to know the serious impacts of the coronavirus and to be mindful of social distancing. If you don't have to be out, please, please, please stay at home. You know, you don't think of these things until it hits close to home and you realize how serious this is. It's not a joke. Absolutely, it is not a joke. Well said, young lady. And tonight, folks, we are learning about the young mom and the nurse who passed away from COVID-19. We first broke this story last night. The Coweta County Coroner says that Deirdre Wilkes worked as a mammogram technician at both Piedmont Noonan and Piedmont Fayette Hospitals. The 42-year-old mom was found dead in her apartment. And this was at the promenade at Noonan Crossing. It happened this past Thursday. And police were reporting that her sister had called 911 after she could not get a hold of Wilkes, which was very unusual. That's when the first responder discovered Wilkes had died. So we're talking about four police officers, two firefighters, and a sheriff's deputy were potentially exposed and are now under quarantine. And you know, despite the repeat warnings, we hear about this all the time, about social distancing, that's why I'm here right now at home. And we've seen a lot of people running and biking and, and still trying to enjoy this wonderful weather, especially along the Beltline. So several cities and counties have declared, as you know, states of emergencies, but Atlanta's order does not include the Beltline and other parks. Cobb County's order does, but 11 Alive's Doug Richards found out that people are just flat out ignoring all of that. Cobb County closed its 44 parks after county commissioners became convinced that the park's patrons weren't being serious about being socially distant while using them. At Terrell Mill Park late morning, we watched Cobb County residents slip past the yellow tape indicating the park was closed. Cobb County is one of only a few jurisdictions that have declared a state of emergency that includes closing of its public parks. Many others have closed park facilities like playgrounds and bathrooms, but not closed off the parks themselves. Cobb's order includes closing its portion of the Silver Comet Trail. Yet Boyce says people disregarded that today too. They believe that, you know, biking on the trail, you know, uh, allows them to meet the six foot guideline. No. You know, the, the, the underlying uh, issue here is the parks are closed, period. And if you're using the parks, you're violating the ordinance. Now, we're not going to sit here and arrest everybody, and you can't arrest everybody. That's not the way to do it. But Boyce says the county should further toughen its restrictions if county officials think residents aren't taking seriously the new restrictions issued Tuesday. Boyce says he does not anticipate Cobb County using its police force to enforce the restriction on parks except to chase away patrons who are using the parks illegally. That was Doug Richards reporting for us tonight. We're going to stay in Cobb County here for a minute because Chairman Boyce has now signed an emergency order to allow sterogenics to resume operations to sterilize medical equipment. And this is because of the COVID-19 outbreak. Sterogenics has voluntarily shut down. This is a story that we've been talking about for months, you know, and it's been weeks since they have been open. And this was amid concerns. It was allegedly leaking cancer, causing toxins into the air. So now this is what's new. This is what's developing. It's been in the process of adding new safety measures. So the FDA has urged local officials to allow the plant to reopen during the outbreak. We're going to have more on exactly what this new emergency authorization allows. That's coming up on Up Late at 11 o'clock. And we know a lot of folks out there, they have opinions about businesses and, you know, being shut down and them not being able to get back to work. So we want to know, what do you think? Is it the right call in what they are doing right now? You can vote on our poll right now on 11alive.com slash vote. Here's Liza Lucas with some of the reactions so far. 
We've seen hundreds of you sharing this update from Cobb County. Many of you also tagging your friends on our Facebook page and sharing your reaction to the news. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, so we want to highlight some of the points we're seeing. Susan, among those questioning the impact of Cobb County's order, since the declaration states that non-essential businesses can still operate between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. On the other side of the conversation, praise for Cobb County officials. And similar to what we saw when the city of Atlanta's shelter in place was announced, some of you continue to call for a statewide mandate in action from Governor Brian Kemp. As a reminder, the social distancing and shelter in place orders are all an effort to flatten the curve. Since coronavirus spreads through person to person contact, experts believe if we distance ourselves from others and stay out of big crowds, we could spread new cases out over a longer period of time, basically buying time for our doctors and nurses to treat those who need help. get back to work. So 11 Alliance Joe Hanke spoke with a small business owner who says that he needs help not only locally, but he needs federal assistance as well. And I am going to remain hopeful that I will qualify for some sort of assistance from federal government or Invest Atlanta and uh, keep pushing on. Courtney Didi owns DOG Pet Services and Training and employs 25 people. Right now, her business is closed during the COVID-19 pandemic, and she is trying to piece together loans to pay her bills and her employees. From the federal government, she applied for an emergency loan from the Small Business Administration. Even though there is interest, it's very low, and they are basing it off of your current monthly expenditures, so rent, utilities, your payroll. The SBA offering loans of up to $2 million. Businesses need credit acceptable to the SBA. First payments are due in one year. The SBA is stressing apply now to get help as quickly as possible as they're hearing from business owners nationwide. DDI also applied for a loan from Invest Atlanta. The goal of the fund is simple, help preserve our small businesses and help preserve jobs in the city of Atlanta. Invest Atlanta CEO Eloisa Clementich says they already have 150 plus applications and the first checks could be sent out as early as next week. $1.5 million in emergency loans from the city are being offered to businesses. Atlanta businesses can receive a loan of $5,000 up to $30,000 with 0% interest and in payments deferred for up to a year. That was Joe Henke reporting for us tonight. You know, most businesses have taken a huge blow, especially airlines. We've seen Delta cut capacity by 70%. And there are times during the uh, during the day at the airport, long known as the uh, being the busiest in the world, looks virtually empty. So an Atlanta City Council member says that they just received an update from Hartsfield Jackson's general manager. He told them passenger volume is down 85% with flights down 65%. The silver lining in all of this for the airport, cargo business is going up, and right now the federal aid package includes $500 billion in aid for corporations, including the airlines. And so, folks, as you know, what we're experiencing right now is unprecedented. This is the first time that we've dealt with this in history. So this is a good time for all of us to come together, and we are proud to announce here at 11 Alive that we're doing right that, along with some other Atlanta news organizations. We're going to be simulcasting a town hall with Governor Brian Kemp. It's going to happen Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Um, it will be broadcast across the entire state. You can see it here, of course, on 11 Alive and our sister station, the WATL, and, of course, right there on our website, 11alive.com. And if you have questions for the governor and a panel of experts, including Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, Text them to the number on your screen. This is a new number for you. So uh, take note of this. It's 404-885-7600, 404-885-7600. And remember, text and do not call. Well, we are constantly updating our 11 Alive app with new information about the pandemic. Keep checking for more on ways to help, to find assistance, and to get facts and not fear about the coronavirus. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers in the basement Storm Tracker Center tonight. On with you live on the ATL as well as talking to folks live on Facebook. Take a look at this. We are in a dry weather pattern for a while, but we are tracking some rain that will return to our area. We'll let you know what part of the weekend that will fall.
uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go to waste. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Auntie. Yeah. Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boil Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. You know, today, Governor Brian Kemp says that he wished that everyone could get tested, but at this point, he says it's just not feasible. So we've been told that people should expect to get those test results back in at least 24 to 72 hours. But the 11 Lives' Ellen Lopez says that she spoke with one woman who says that she has been tested and still it's been more than a week and she hasn't gotten the results back. But there is more testing ramping up. I think one of the frustrations that everybody has had, me included, is the with the private sector labs, it's still taking four to five days for them to get those test results back. In Rosa Santiago Zimmerman's case, it's been at nine days. I just have this hacking cough, and sometimes this cough will last for like 30 seconds where I'm just coughing, 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 and the burning sensation in my lungs. The 49-year-old with no underlying medical condition is still waiting to find out from Georgia urgent Karen Brasselton whether she has COVID-19. You are dealing with, you know, 10, 15, 20 people that I came in contact with that are out there that have no idea whether they are COVID-19 positive or negative. Governor Brian Kemp says he's aware of a test that could yield results in just 45 minutes. It, it would be great if we could get access to those, but I don't think that they've gotten quite to the market yet, even though the FDA has approved it. As of today, Rosa says she remains in quarantine, waiting along with her husband and daughter, who are now also showing symptoms. I was told that they cannot be tested until my results come in. Overwhelmed and discouraged, but determined to keep on helping and fighting against that virus. Uh, that's how one nurse in Metro Atlanta says she feels because she works at a hot spot hotspot where there are a lot of cases. So we spoke with her. We didn't want to show her face to make sure that her identity remains confidential. However, she felt that it was important that she shares her story. And so did we. They are scared. They all have families and loved ones they are going home to after they've been exposed to the virus. They are very overwhelmed and stretched already as far as the workload. We definitely are running out of space in those in the critical care areas, in the ICU. So we've more than doubled what our normal ICU bed size is, and that is already full. So I don't know what the plan is in the coming days and weeks as we expect the patient load in the critical care areas to expand even more. It, it is going to get full. It is going to get overwhelmed. It is going to happen quickly. All right, so to put this into perspective, Grady Memorial Hospital said it was operating at or near capacity as of Monday with an influx of COVID-19 patients and limited resources. Hopeful that stronger restrictions in the city of Atlanta and statewide would actually help, right? Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and the governor are working on plans to address the need for more beds, setting up temporary medical facilities. You know, more than, this is really a, a bright spot here. More than 100 doctors and nurses have offered to help 
to come out of retirement or new graduates going straight to work, graduates going straight to work. Well, on Monday, the governor said the state would honor those medical licenses. And he says that response is a bright spot, spot in all of this as we continue to fight this virus. So that is gonna be a, a great, reliable workforce to have uh, when we have a surge or if we start having frontline healthcare workers go down because they have the coronavirus. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We are in the basement Storm Tracker Center tonight as we are doing our part for social distancing, limiting the number of people in our building as well. And so it's a great day. And I, well, yesterday I was in the studio because we had that severe weather threat, but I'm back in the um, basement studio tonight. I love saying that. That's kind of cool. And you notice my phone right here. I know it's right there in the shot. You can see that. I'm also on Facebook Live right now or on Facebook doing a Facebook Live. So if you want to go over to my page when I'm finished with this weather and you can continue our conversation. We've got around 200 people on right now um, and I'm going to give them a little tour of the behind the scenes in just a second of how this is set up. So let's talk about weather right now. Here is radar. This is the feed coming in directly from our weather computers back at the station. So this is live current data that's coming in right now. And it's very nice to show that there is no rain in our area or any rain in the southeast. We're finally getting this opportunity to dry out for the next couple of days. So here's a look at our temperatures over the past 20 hours. And you can see as we go back to one in the morning, that's when we had some of those showers and storms that were rolling through. Temperatures then moved down into the lower 60s. That rain was ending. And then as it moved out, the clouds started to break up and we saw the sunshine reappear and temperatures made it up to 73 degrees this afternoon for a high. So that was really nice. That's running a little bit above the average for this time of year. Here's where we are right now. Did you notice those temperatures once the sun went down? Started cooling down pretty nicely, pretty quickly. We have clear skies that allows radiational cooling. So any heat that build, built up today is escaping into the atmosphere. We're in the mid 60s right now. So still not frigid or anything, but it's just cooling down pretty nicely tonight. We do have 50s in Canton, 50s in Blairsville, Clayton, and also in the Dalton area. So here's what we're watching for the overnight hours. We'll see these temperatures dropping from the 60s into the 50s, and then we'll fall through those 50s into the lower 50s here by tomorrow morning with those mainly clear skies that we're going to be dealing with. So on Thursday on the wasometer, how about a 10? Not quite an 11 because of this. This temperature of 78, although that's going to feel great with mostly sunny skies, it's a little bit above the average. So that's why it's not a perfect day. We also may see a few more clouds, especially over in East Georgia early in the morning. Here we are right, right now looking fine with clear skies. I want you to watch this east wind as it builds in. A few clouds are going to accompany that in East Georgia and then sweep into the metro Atlanta area around lunchtime. So at times, those clouds will block out the sunshine for a little bit, but it's not going to last long. We will see more sunshine as we head into the afternoon hours and temperatures that will be moving up into the mid to upper 70s. And then on Friday, this is in the morning, you can see sunshine mixing in with a few clouds. We're going with partly cloudy skies here on Friday, but no rain in our area, thank goodness. And even as we head into the weekend, Saturday, we will see a few more clouds, but watch these temperatures. We go from 78 Thursday, 84 Friday, 83 Saturday with more clouds, and then a few scattered showers on Sunday, dry Monday, and then a few more scattered showers for Tuesday and Wednesday as we cool back down into the 60s. I'm going to continue this weather conversation, so join me on Facebook Live. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. You know, in the sports world, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. I'm sure Major League Baseball, the NFL, all of them, the NBA, trying to figure out what are we going to do next? They have to wait for that. But what about for us right here in Georgia and Atlanta, the AJC Peachtree Road Race? Is that going to happen? Well, 11 Lives Alex Glaze actually spoke with the director, and he says, as of right now, the race is on. The Atlanta Track Club is preparing for the 51st running of the Peachtree Road Race. But this year, the planning process has been different. Our staff is getting intimately familiar with Google Hangout. There are roughly 35 people working on the plan for the peach tree, and all of them are following the recommendations and guidelines the city of Atlanta has in place to fight the coronavirus. The Atlanta Track Club is planning full steam ahead with the understanding that things might not go as planned. There is nothing off the table 
uh, in our planning process for 2020. In these times of uncertainty, uh, we have to plan for everything. Planning for everything includes postponement and cancellation of the race. In the previous 50 consecutive runnings of the peach tree, there has never been a cancellation or postponement. The race has always happened on the 4th of July. This year, with health and safety on the minds of almost everybody, the most important thing is ensuring that everything is safe for the world's largest 10K. Our mission is about health and fitness. Um, so we won't have this event uh, if there's any doubt of, about our ability to deliver it in, in a safe manner on July 4th. For your next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boil Water Advisory. Hyperlocal, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you just do what I say. I'm no, 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 You kill the super. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, I sent my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Stop. I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've like got him. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess? I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh. Uh. You know, in America, more than 60,000 people have been confirmed with having the coronavirus, and that number is expected to climb. So here's some startling numbers. The U.S. death toll was at 802 early Wednesday, eclipsing uh, 600 on Tuesday. Now a growing number of states and counties across the country, they're trying to clamp down on residents and their movements around the country. So we're talking about more than 100 million Americans ordered to stay home. Jay Gray has more on that. It's hard not to be happy with the job we're doing. President Trump lauding his administration's response to the coronavirus pandemic and continuing his push for a quick return to business as usual. It's going to open up uh, like a rocket ship. I think it's going to go very good and very quickly. Right now, though, communities across the country are facing a more immediate challenge. As concern grows over the manpower and resources available to fight the outbreak. More than 60,000 Americans sick, more than 800 dead. Tragic numbers expanding much faster than initially expected. The increase is absolutely staggering. And we know that we're really at the beginning of this. Case numbers are increasing on a daily basis. And soon our hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. Many on the front lines of the fight are already overwhelmed. First responders not only overworked, but falling ill. We're currently at about 3,200 members on the uniform side. Um, out sick. Uh, okay. It's about triple the rate that we normally see. In New York, the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak, the governor calling on retired medical professionals to come back for reserve duty. 
God bless them, 40,000 people have signed up as a surge healthcare force. 2,000 physicians, anesthesiologists, emergency room technicians, nurse practitioners. Similar teams will be needed around the clock and across the country as the battle against the virus intensifies. Straight ahead, the coronavirus is taking a major toll on our day-to-day -day lives. A former regional director of FEMA says this pandemic is the largest disaster our nation has ever faced. We're going to hear from him next. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. They <laughs> are fun. They're and they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. I just That's feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a new yeah. way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together our voices grow. Together we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they didn't yeah. wait the next week. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey The number of COVID-19 cases here in Georgia continues to rise. Right now, there are more than 1,300 confirmed cases in 97 counties, 47 people confirmed dead. And now multiple counties have issued a state of emergency, hoping to contain the spread of the virus. Johns Hopkins University is now reporting more than 450,000 cases worldwide. The United States is in the top three. China has by far the most cases, more than 80,000. Italy has more than 74,000 cases, but has the most death out of any other country with a little more than 7,500. You know, the, the updates for coronavirus keeps coming in daily, fast and furious. Sometimes it's difficult to keep up. However, we are committed to do that, to make sure that we keep your family safe. You're gonna see a lot of that right here for three hours on primetime news. So here are some of the other headlines you may have missed, but they're very important. Uh, the $2 trillion bipartisan coronavirus aid package is still languishing in, in Congress as we speak, with the Senate still debating unemployment benefits. Now to the American Red Cross. 
Uh, they're in desperate need of blood right now. While thousands of blood drives have been canceled, they are still accepting appointments at local offices. You can find a help and a link on our website at 11alive.com. The Atlanta Falcons is the latest NFL team to offer some relief to season ticket holders. Because of COVID-19, fans can defer their next installment payment from April 1st to July 1st. Our media partner at the Atlanta Business Chronicle reports the team will decide about the future payments in the coming month. The latest shortage created by COVID-19, dogs and cats. Get this, dogs and cats. Bloomberg is reporting that New York City is now running out of pets to foster after a surge in applications of people being stuck at home, working from home, furloughed, or maybe because of unemployment. Well, the former Southeast uh, Regional Director FEMA says the coronavirus is the largest disaster we have ever faced in our country. And he told Caitlin Ross it's going to require the entire country to pull together to get through this virus. This kind of a disaster, a biomedical disaster, is a different kind of a disaster. John Copenhaver responded to hurricanes, tornadoes and wildfires during his time at FEMA under President Clinton's administration, but says he never dealt with anything like COVID-19. The president named FEMA as the lead response agency. It needs to be really FEMA working very, very closely with the National Institutes for Health, the Centers for Disease Control and uh, medical authorities. He thinks the response needs to be more unified than what we see now in Georgia, with different cities and counties declaring their own individual state of emergencies, which can widely vary. If one area effectively responds, but other areas that are within a certain geographical distance don't, then you could have a, a problem with people coming to the area that didn't respond as effectively into the area that managed to, con to somewhat contain the virus and starting the cycle all over again. He thinks the United States should learn from countries that got the virus under control quickly, like South Korea, where they had more immediate widespread testing and isolating people who are sick. Since March 11th, they've seen a general decline in new cases. What did they do and do effectively? Copenhaver believes the United States response now will be effective though it may have taken too long to get here. Lag time in between things getting worse, which has happened so quickly with this virus, and the spin up of, of government operations to be able to respond is causing some degree of fear and frustration. But they need to know that there really are world-class people that are a part of this response effort. I tell you what, if you're a parent at home, it can be really challenging. So you're wearing a lot of hats, right? You're an employee. You are a teacher, you know, trying to make sure that your kids are doing their homework. And you're also a therapist helping them to manage all of this. For 11 Lives, Rebecca Lindstrom, she spent some time with a couple of moms and how they're managing this new norm. Comprehensive worksheet. We met Ashley Mahoney's family on the first week schools closed. Life seemed pretty well under control. The most challenging right now is making sure that by the end of the week, we still have the same momentum. By week two, momentum remains intact, but the challenges of getting stuff done are more apparent, like the three-year-old running in the background, turning on and off the lights. It's given this mom a valuable lesson. Accepting that it's not going to be perfect and learning to roll with punches. Mahoney says her son is diligent about his homework, but it doesn't all make it to the teachers. Connor's concerned. Worrying about getting bad grades. Can you tell her? Mahoney has worries too. She's had to step away from at least one important web meeting for work. Cece had just had enough. And, you know, she wouldn't sit, she was crying. She, I mean, she, she was done. When I asked Mahoney how she was feeling. Trying to be upbeat for my kids. That look really says it all, and it's about the same look I got from this mom. My oldest and that's Courtney Gibbs has a seven-year-old son with special needs. Aiden is pre-verbal. He's just learning to talk and doesn't really understand what's going on. He went from having a very busy schedule, school all day, and then therapy after school. And we were doing seven therapies a week. That's now down to three. So it goes. Gibbs hopes those programs are able to stay open. She needs the support and Aiden needs the interaction. But we are seeing some behavior that we have not seen in a very long time come back. Some aggression. Gibbs tries to keep him busy with the things he loves. 
Disney music playing outdoors. It's tough for him to sit down and focus on a computer-based lesson. And her older son, he is an IEP as well. So he's running around, he's loud, he's happy. And then my oldest is upstairs like, Mom, I need help. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And I'm like, I don't know what to do, you know, because I feel like I'm being pulled in every direction. Despite the challenges, both moms say the time with their children is priceless. You know, maybe incorporate some cooking or, you know, just more talks. And, you know, because I, you know, we never have time for just those simple things. And there have been successes too. We've been able to potty train in our house. This is a huge deal. I've heard from a lot of parents that it's the uncertainty that is really the hardest part, not knowing just what to tell your kids. And these moms say they certainly agree. Man, I tell you what, this is a tough time for all those parents, all those parents out there. And of course, we tip our hats to them. Hey, COVID-19 is now forcing the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra to temporarily shut down, so this is what we know. The doors of the Symphony Hall will be closed through May 11th. Business operations will move online. Musicians will play for the public through online platforms like Facebook Watch. 11 Alive spoke to the executive director, and she says while maintaining an online presence is key, the cancellation of live performances forces the symphony to lose millions. We've lost already millions of dollars in revenue from the concerts that we had previously um, had to cancel. And um, you know, the value of the endowment has been reduced, as has everyone's um, invested funds. We've been here for we've been here for many years. We'll be here for many more with the support of the community. Um, but there's really no way to um, overstate how how incredibly devastating this is for the institution financially. All right, so you have a ticket to a canceled show. Organizers are, are asking you to donate its value back to the orchestra. And although this season has been canceled, the symphony is excited for next season, which will be dedicated to the retirement of musical director and conductor Robert Fano. This is an amazing story. This is one woman's wish to help a lot of those folks on the front lines. We're talking about the nurses and doctors out there, and she did it with 500 Chick-fil-A sandwiches, and she's excited about it, and so is everyone else who's supporting her. Look at this. Hey, friends. It's Cecily and Rachel. Um, and Rachel had a brilliant idea a couple days ago that we should go to Chick-fil-A and take some sandwiches to some of our local hospitals. It all came from me feeling really overwhelmed and scared and wanting to help people. People started sharing it on social media, and it just took on a life of its own, really. Friends, we're at Northside Hospital. We're about to load up all the Chick-fil-A sandwiches and take them inside. So let's see what we find. I'm up to almost 500 sandwiches. Wow. At first, I think we're just bringing them like a couple meals, you know, but when then they see it's hundreds of sandwiches, they have just been so appreciative. And all right, friends, that is a wrap for our Chick-fil-A delivery. Thanks so much for coming along with us. Uh, thank you for everybody that donated your points. You just uh, be kind to each other and help each other. You know, it's not that hard to love your neighbor like yourself. Amen to that. You know, as the coronavirus spreads, Wall Street is trying everything it can to stay afloat. Coming up, a financial expert's advice on how you can ensure your finances stay untouched. We're in a dry weather pattern right now. Thank goodness this one is going to stick around for a while. It's not only dry here now, but also dry around the entire southeast. Stay with us. We'll let you know how the temperatures will rebound with this additional sunshine. Live to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm gonna go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at two in the morning to be here. 
where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire yeah. week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go oh, to waste. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, auntie. No. <laughs> auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyperlocal, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you just do what I say. I'm no, 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 Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Oh, I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've nice got guy. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7, 8. Welcome back, everyone. We have some positive news on Wall Street, something we need to hear right now. The Dow Jones, uh, it had traded, ended trading today with a second straight day of gains of nearly 500 points. But there's a lot of uncertainty for millions of Americans out there when it comes to their personal finances. What's going to happen in the future, especially as we wait for a possible stimulus bill to pass through Congress? In the meantime, we spoke with a local financial expert and got some tips on how to help our personal budgets right now. Uh, the big question you should be asking yourself right now is uh, do you need it or do you want it? If you don't, if it's something that you want versus need, I would cut out and only focus on the needs. $20 here, $50 there, all starts making a uh, impact to the bottom line. If you are not on uh, budget billing with your utilities, with Georgia Power uh, or gas provider, call them up. See if you can get on a budget billing to be able to track and know how much you will pay as far as your uh, your utilities each month. So you're on a fixed plan in a sense, and you can predict what your cost is going to be for the next couple of months to be able to live. Uh, if you have savings or an emergency fund, now is the time to begin uh, to use that. And we have more on how you can get financial help during this very stressful time on our website at 11alive.com. Grocery stores, staffers play a vital part in helping us get food on the table and the supplies we need. But how are they managing? And what can we do to ensure everyone's safety when shopping? In the midst of shutdowns and social distancing, Grocery store clerks are seeing a sustained spike in demand as shoppers stock up for a pandemic. Sales have gone up tremendously, and uh, customers are just coming in and buying up uh, products at unseen levels. Jared Labar usually works in the corporate office for King Supermarkets, but now he's in stores helping to restock. Is there anything that people can do to help all of these workers who are on the front lines? The biggest thing for us is, the, you know, just make sure that they are adhering to the social distancing. 
To keep that distance and protect workers from the constant flow of customers, Albertsons, HEB and Kroger are installing plexiglass shields in the checkout line. Just remember that we're human beings too and we have feelings and yeah, just take care of us too because we're taking care of them. Workers asking customers to be patient and understanding when items are sold out. Despite assurances that the supply chain is working, some stores continue to report gaps in what they normally provide. We are actually out of ground turkey at the moment. Still, essential items are available thanks to staff providing some normalcy during an abnormal time. Somebody's got to be here. I mean, people need food. There's some things you can live without. Food is not one of them. And on social media, a flood of appreciation in the form of art like this. Workers hailed as heroes and thanked by many for being brave. This banner hung across the street from a store in Brooklyn. Thanks for the groceries. We love you. They're really awesome. And to be here like during this time, during this time period where it's really tough, it, it takes a brave person. With data showing the average grocery store worker makes $29,000 a year, these staffers are working overtime to provide basic services to keep society running. Well, I don't consider myself a hero. Karen, a cashier from New Jersey, tells us she's just doing her job. It's our job to make sure that you have what you need. So next time you see your cashier, just say thank you. It means a lot. This time last night, we I was back in the studio because we were tracking showers and thunderstorms that were moving through. Some of those were strong. We had numerous counties that were in severe thunderstorm warnings late in the evening last night. We even had tornado warnings back into Alabama. Those storms moved through during the overnight hours. And then today, we had a chance to improve. After some clouds this morning, we cleared out, had a lot of sunshine today. Really, really nice day out there with high temperatures that made it up to about 73 degrees. Here's a look at radar right now, and looking all around the southeast, we're not seeing any rain in the area, and that just goes to show this drier pattern that is in place right now. Here's a look at temperatures around North Georgia. It is cooling after that high today of 73. We're back down into the mid-60s at this hour, and it's even cooler in Covington at 60. 51, 59 in Carrollton, Canton is 59. We have more 50s up in North Georgia as well. And with clear skies, we often see a wide range of temperatures out there. And that's what we're seeing tonight. And we're going to cool off a little bit more tonight, but it's not going to be frigid. And then in the morning, we start off in the lower 50s. And then watch these temperatures during the day tomorrow. This starts at 9, where it's going to be 55. We will see a few clouds early in the morning. That'll be mixing in with some sunshine at times to around the lunchtime hour then decreasing clouds in the afternoon with plenty of sunshine for the afternoon. And it's a little bit warmer tomorrow than what we had today. This model is saying 76. I'm going two degrees higher than that, saying we'll have a high of about 78 degrees tomorrow. So here's a look at what we're watching with our weather headlines. We're finally entering in to a dry streak. For a few days, it is going to be dry. Our next rain chance really won't come back until Sunday, and that's not going to be a washout, just going to be a few scattered showers. And temperatures getting warmer each day. We'll be in the mid to upper 70s tomorrow, and then 80s here for Friday, and then also into Saturday, more 80s. So that's going to be feeling pretty nice with that warmer air that'll move our way. Average high for this time of year is around 67 degrees, so we're way above the average. And that's why we're just going with a 10 on the wasometer tomorrow, not an 11, for two reasons. Number one, we will have a few clouds around mixing in with the sunshine at times and that 78 degree temperature is way above average so that wouldn't be quite a perfect day here for uh, the mid to the end of march so here's the forecast track we're going to see dry conditions out there for tonight and then in the morning this is what i'm talking about that east wind setting up it's going to send in just a few clouds but no rain this model trying to show a couple of maybe light showers around the georgia south carolina line but that all falls apart at lunchtime a few clouds here, but those clouds will start breaking up during the afternoon hours, giving us some sunshine and then plenty of sunshine in the afternoon with those temperatures that will be rebounding very nicely during the day, getting up to the 70s and then even 80s after that. So here's the seven day outlook. Things looking great. We're going to see mostly sunny skies tomorrow again in the morning, maybe in morning to lunchtime, a couple of clouds that will be mixing in highs near 78, 84 Friday partly cloudy skies. Both of those days will be tens though on the wasometer. And then a few more clouds build in on Saturday. Scattered showers develop on Sunday. It cools back down to the mid 70s. 
Lower 70s Monday, I think we'll get a break in those rain chances, and then they come back to 30% on Tuesday, and then 50% chance on Wednesday, and those temperatures will also be a little bit cooler Tuesday and Wednesday, with highs going back down into the 60s. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. You know, with a shortage of masks continuing, many of you are asking about uh, making your own at home. So we had our Verify team to look to see if, you know, if that's, you know, possible. But the real question she we should be asking, does it really work? Here's Jason Puckett. Viewer Ann P sent us a question about making protective masks. She'd seen instructions online and wanted to know if they worked. And Ann is definitely not alone. There are a lot of articles about this right now. So let's break this down. Can you make your own masks? Do they work? And when should you even be wearing a mask? Our sources, the WHO and CDC. So one reason this question is gaining steam online is that people are posting patterns and encouraging others to make the masks. This Forbes article says, quote, if you think that handmade masks can't be used, think again. Even the CDC has a place for them in times of crisis like the one we're in right now. So this is technically true, but it needs some context. The CDC does have a page dedicated to optimizing the supply of face masks. They have different recommendations based on conventional, contingency, and crisis situations. And all the way at the bottom of the page, below crisis situations, there's an important point about using homemade masks. The CDC says these should be a last resort, only used with other protective measures, and that their ability to protect healthcare workers is unknown. Basically, the CDC says they don't know if homemade masks are effective and should only be used when nothing else is available. The WHO agrees with that. They say that medical masks should only be worn if you're caring for a sick person or if you yourself are coughing or sneezing. WHO guidelines say that cloth masks, like cotton or gauze, are not recommended under any circumstances. And most of home patterns call for using cloth of some sort. So we can verify, neither the CDC or WHO recommend using homemade masks. Got any other questions? Send us an email. With us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, right. About I mean, that. Well, reward would be Slimming down. Okay. Yes. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your Morning Rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hot spots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crock Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures.
We have a nice dry pattern that's going to last for a few days. We're going to see mostly sunny skies here Thursday, partly cloudy skies Friday. Look at those temperatures warming up from 78 Thursday to 84 Friday. A few more clouds Saturday with highs near 83 and then scattered showers Sunday, a break Monday with more showers coming in for Tuesday and Wednesday, cooling back down to the 60s for next week. All right, this from your basement to Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. They are <laughs> fun. They're and they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. So what's the best part about Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together, we come alive, amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they didn't yeah. wait the next week. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South, and it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home, from different backgrounds, languages, and religions, and who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot, full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL. Now at 10, now. new numbers from the state on coronavirus cases. There are now nearly 1,400 confirmed cases in our state and 47 deaths. That's seven new deaths since noon today. These numbers keep growing by the day as the state ramps up its coronavirus testing. This graph really puts the pandemic in perspective for our state. It shows just how rapidly the cases have grown since the beginning of March. You can see we went from single digits to more than 3,000 cases in just over three weeks. We're going to have a county by county breakdown in our next half hour. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Hullinger, broadcasting live from my home tonight. And you are going to see an exclusive now that is from 11 Alive, as hospitals are in the thick of it as they battle this awful pandemic that shows no signs of lightening up. This week, a Georgia hospital told healthcare workers that tested positive that they don't have symptoms, but they still need to keep working. And that has sparked backlash from workers and loved ones on social media. Faith Dubuve shows us why that policy changed. The problem is that until that patient's test comes back positive, nurses are being told to take care of that patient 
without any protective equipment. A Georgia nurse says she's worried healthcare workers are being exposed to COVID-19 on the job. And hospitals are having to make tough decisions because of a shortage of vital medical equipment. And now a memo to hospital staff at Phoebe Health in Southwest Georgia on Monday is raising even more concerns. The letter posted on social media says the Department of Public Health requires all health care workers to be tested for COVID-19, even if they're not showing any symptoms of the virus. And even if they do test positive, they should continue working as long as they are symptom free. We had uh, very long uh, uh, animated conversations uh, with the local health department, with the state health department, uh, asking them to reconsider, uh, discussing what position this would put us in and would put any healthcare organization in. And uh, unfortunately, they felt like they were under, under a federal mandate uh, to do that. Scott Steiner is CEO of Phoebe Health. The CDC still recommends that you can work uh, as long as you wear a mask the entire time uh, that you are, are working. Because if, if, if we don't have nurses and doctors, um, tell me who's going to care for our patients. The nurse at another Georgia hospital echoes concerns about the work requirements. Am I an asymptomatic carrier of the virus being told to still work? If what we are being told is if we are not showing symptoms of infection, we should still work. And that's regardless of how great our exposure has been. It, it's, not, it's not a perfect situation. Steiner says DPH signed off on the original memo to employees, requiring them to keep working even if they test positive for COVID-19. DPH tells the reveal it was a mistake that unfortunately was not caught in the approval process. And that, that's the other piece of this. Everybody's looking for the exact right answer, and, and there isn't one. Uh, I'd love to be able to say, hey, if you've tested, tested positive, go home, you know, take, take whatever it is, seven days or two weeks. Um, but again, remember, we have to run a hospital here. Um, otherwise, we would have to, to shut down. And, and most organizations are in that same uh, position. Concerns about the original memo has now forced changes at Phoebe Health. And because the CDC is giving local authorities some flexibility to avoid staffing shortages, DPH says once confirmed as positive, any staff member must be excluded from the hospital and remain in isolation per routine protocol. They should only work if they are asymptomatic or waiting for their COVID-19 test results and have proper protective gear. We are operating by the best information that we have from the CDC, other agencies, um, and just again trying to make sure that our staff is safe, that we're taking care of them and that we're able to focus on taking care of all of our patients. Kelly Halsey with Piedmont Health says if employees are not showing symptoms, they can still work, but they are not being tested until they show symptoms. Emory and Grady Hospital also say they are not testing health care workers who are not showing symptoms. Children's Health Care and Wellstar say employees can stay home if they show symptoms. In a sea of muddled messages, all the health care workers we talk to say they're still doing the best they can in a growing pandemic. At Phoebe Health, once a staff member is exposed to the virus, they can only work with COVID positive and suspected patients. You know, what we tell our patients is that their safety uh, and their health care is our most important uh, item and that we would never put them uh, intentionally at risk, that the measures that we have put into place to protect them and to protect our staff uh, to protect our doctors are what the CDC and, and the experts have recommended. Phoebe Health says that several hundred employees who are not showing symptoms for the coronavirus have now been asking for the test, and they are still waiting for the results. Faith asked the CDC to clarify its return to work guidelines for health care workers. They say the final decision should be up to public health officials and also should be up to local hospitals. Today, Governor Kemp says he believes that coronavirus has been around in our state longer than many thought. In fact, he's- The more testing we do, the more positives we're gonna see. And it's, it's for several reasons. Number one, people already had this disease over a month ago in our state. Uh, there's some, and, and I'm one of them, that believes this virus has been here since potentially December or early January. 
So to put this into perspective, Hartsfield Jackson told us on January 21st, it would begin screening passengers on flights originating from China amid the growing outbreak overseas. In late February, airports started screening other international travelers. On March 2nd, we learned a father and his 15-year-old son tested positive in Fulton County. The father returned about a week before from Italy, but said he didn't feel sick until several days later. Now, most businesses have taken a huge blow because of the coronavirus outbreak, particularly the airlines. We have seen Delta cut capacity by some 70 percent. An Atlanta City Council member says they received an update from Hartsfield Jackson's general manager, and he told them that passenger volume is down 85 percent, with flights down 65 percent. The silver lining, and there is one. That is some good news amidst all of this woe. Cargo business is going up. Right now, the federal aid package includes $500 billion in aid for corporations, and that includes the airlines. New at 10, the Dow seeing some dramatic gains today, a second day in anticipation of that $2 trillion emergency aid bill that includes direct payments to most Americans. Once the House approves the plan, possibly in the next day or two, it will be the biggest emergency bailout in the history of the United States. John Shirick tonight on that money that many of us will receive. Cash in our pockets and bailouts for our employers to save our jobs. A $2 trillion quick fix for what the president still hopes will be a quickly passing crisis. A lot of this money goes to jobs, 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 and families, families, families. The plan, if you're single and make less than $75,000 a year, you'll get $1,200. If you're married and make less than $150,000, you'll get $2,400. Plus, parents will get an additional $500 for each child. You'll get less money if you have a bigger salary. But an individual who earns more than $99,000 won't get anything. And married couples without children who earn more than $198,000 won't get anything. That's just part of the coronavirus cash on the way. We're going to take care of the American worker. We're going to take care of these companies that fuel this country and make the country great. It's not their fault. There's more money for unemployment benefits. An extra $600 per week for up to four months, including gig economy workers and freelance and more than $100 billion for hospitals. The government says people who have direct deposit accounts with the IRS could start receiving their cash within three weeks. Mailed checks could take a month or longer. So updates on coronavirus now are coming fast and furious. It really is hard to keep up. So what we want to do right now is three things that you may have missed during the course of the day. First of all, MARTA is temporarily suspending bus fares starting tomorrow. The fare boxes are at the front of the box. Riders will now enter and exit through the rear doors of the buses, except for riders who need to use the accessibility ramp. MARTA will also close some public restrooms. Numbers yesterday compared to a month ago show that bus and rail ridership are both down by more than 50%. UGA plans to start issuing refunds to students on Monday. The school says since students were more than halfway through the semester, it is refunding 46 percent of some fees like athletic, recreation and transportation fees, plus portions of housing and dining costs as well. But it says, based on guidance from the University System of Georgia, it won't refund tuition or certain fees like the technology fee. This is troubling. Waffle House is closing more than a fifth of its restaurants to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The restaurants are normally open 24-7. The Georgia-based chain has closed 418 locations. The world's largest coronavirus lockdown has trapped Gwinnett County for a, a couple of weeks. New tonight, they went to India to bring their adopted daughter back to Atlanta Metro. And they tell our Ryan Kruger they cannot even leave their hotel room at this point. Listen to this stat. One sixth of the world's population in lockdown tonight after India's prime minister banned all international flights, ordering more than a billion people to stay inside. Michael and Whitney Saville have wanted to adopt a baby ever since they were in college. In the past year, they've fallen in love with Grace. They tell me they fought through mountains of red tape for the last year trying to bring her home from India. But now they're trapped. You're trying to stay in good spirits? Trying her best. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. been harder. Um, it's been hard. The Savills traveled to India earlier this month. They finally got Grace's passport, but by then it was too late. The world's largest lockdown went into effect Wednesday morning. 
they only gave us 48 hours notice. Um, and so we actually tried to get Mike a ticket to go home um, and be with our other children, but everything was booked. They've talked to the embassy and Senator David Perdue's office. Both agencies are working for them, but right now, no flights are available in or out of the country. They fear they're stuck here for the next three weeks in a hotel. In the meantime, they are making the best of it and getting a unique chance to bond with their new daughter. It's been really good for her um, just to have the two on one time, and she's um, she's handling it really well. And adding to their worries, the Savills tell me they have three young boys at home in Gwinnett County. Thankfully, relatives are looking after them for the time being. So many stories like these. Ryan Kruger, thank you. Information about coronavirus now is coming in fast. The easiest way to stay up to date is to download the 11 Alive News app. We will send you alerts right to your phone. Well, what we are all experiencing is unprecedented, so you have all of Atlanta's media outlets coming together on the television side to make sure that you are informed. And what's going to happen is a town hall meeting with Governor Kemp, Keisha Lance Bottoms, the Atlanta mayor also will be there as well. It will be simulcast tomorrow night at 8 o'clock and broadcast across the state. You can see it on our sister station, 11 Alive, and here on the Big 36 on the ATL, and of course, on 11alive.com. Chris? I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and we are seeing those weather conditions out there right now that are dry in our area, and they will continue to stay dry as we move through the next couple of days. That's going to be a, a nice thing for us here. Stay with us. We'll have much more for you coming up in just a few minutes. Also coming up, doctors are noticing new symptoms patterns when it comes to COVID-19 in patients. Up next, what that could mean for treating the virus. We got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, right. I mean, that. Reward would be slimming, slimming down. Okay, yes. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay. yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Cross Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. And welcome back, everyone. I'm Jeff Hollinger, and we are broadcasting tonight from my home in Midtown. We want to clarify there are 1387. 1387, 1,387 cases in the state of Georgia of coronavirus right now. And we continue to learn more and more about the symptoms of this fast moving pandemic. There is a pattern that some physicians are noticing tonight. Some patients have moderate symptoms for a week and then they get better. But then there are other examples where patients are having mild symptoms for about a week and then suddenly they become much worse. Here's NBC's Joe Fryer with an update for us tonight. For some patients, doctors say the first phase of COVID-19 is more like a slow burn with moderate symptoms for several days, even a week before things rapidly go downhill. Similar to the experience of Congressman Ben McAdams, who spoke with Today last Thursday. I'm feeling pretty bad. I think this is probably the worst cold I've ever had, but we're getting by. Over the first six days of McAdams' illness, his symptoms included a cough, fever, and shortness of breath. 
and my lungs were really constricted. I uh, felt like I had a belt around my chest. And so I but on Friday, a day after this interview, McAdams was hospitalized, saying, I experienced severe shortness of breath and struggled to maintain my blood oxygen at appropriate levels. He says he's now feeling relatively better. In addition to the well-known coronavirus symptoms, fever, cough, headache, and shortness of breath, doctors now say some patients may lose their sense of smell and taste. Utah Jazz player Rudy Gobert, who tested positive tweeted haven't been able to smell anything for the last four days experts say if that happens and if it's your only symptom and you don't have allergies call your doctor that does seem to be a little bit more of a common thread that i think was underappreciated initially dr keith mortman at george washington university hospital stresses everyone even young people needs to take coronavirus seriously he made this video showing the extent of damage done to the lungs of an actual 59 year old patient who's in critical condition with covid 19. this is not the common flu this is not your garden variety pneumonia this is something that we have not seen or experienced before and we all have to do our part and we all have to take it seriously Dr. Mortman says it's still way too early to know the long-term damage caused by coronavirus, even in younger patients. Well, this was a beautiful spring day today, and as we take a look at uh, Chris's forecast down the road, a lot of tens I'm seeing, a lot of sunshine, and a lot of flowers that are going to be blooming, Chris. Yeah, I think we deserve this, Jeff, because we have been so wet. We're way above average in rainfall for the year, and we finally have a few days to dry out. And today was just the beginning of that, as we saw the clouds from this morning and those showers and storms from last night move away. The sunshine returned, and temperatures made it up to 73 degrees today. Right now, we're cooling down, and with the clear skies, we have a pretty wide range of temperatures all around. In Atlanta, we're 62. Peachtree City is 67, Athens is 64, but look at some of these cool spots like over in LaGrange where it's in the 50s already at 58, 58 in Carrollton, 57 in Marietta. We have that cooler air up in North Georgia too. In fact, Blairsville 50, close to the 40s right now up in the North Georgia mountains. We're going to watch these temperatures as they fall tonight, moving down into the lower 50s. And then by 9, we're back up to 55. This is a look at our hour-by-hour hour forecast during the daytime hours tomorrow. And some pretty quick rises in those temperatures. Notice we do have a couple of little partly cloudy symbols here for the mid-morning and around the lunchtime hour. We're going to be watching a few clouds that try to filter in from the east, and that will kind of mix in with the sunshine at times, but it's not going to be overcast. We'll still see some sun with that. And then becoming mostly sunny in the afternoon, high temperatures. Uh, this model saying 76. I'm actually going a couple of degrees warmer than that, going up to 78 degrees for our high temperature. So here's what we're watching with our weather headlines as we see a dry pattern setting up. Yeah, finally a dry streak here. And temperatures also getting warmer. I mentioned today was 73. That's a little warmer than we were yesterday. Uh, actually, that's a, a little cooler than we were yesterday. And then we're a little warmer tomorrow, going back up into the, uh, in the mid-70s and upper 70s, and then 80s here for Friday and also into your Saturday. So on the wisometer tomorrow, we're going to go with a 10. We're going to start off with temperatures right around 52, then get up to 78 with uh, mostly sunny skies. There will be just a few clouds that will mix in with the sunshine at times. And that's because of this. Watch this easterly flow that's coming in here from the east. This model even trying to show a couple of light showers possible along the Georgia, South Carolina line. But we'll see these clouds moving into our area, mixing in with the sunshine. This is at lunchtime. It's not going to be a complete overcast, though. And then it moves out quickly, and we'll see sunshine for the afternoon hours. And then as we head into Friday, starting off mostly sunny, but partly cloudy skies during the day and more of a southwesterly flow, that is what's going to bring those temperatures back into the 80s for the end of the week. 78 Thursday, 84 Friday, 83 Saturday. Notice the cloud cover building in on Saturday. That brings in a couple of showers for Sunday, but not a total washout. Dry Monday, more scattered showers for Tuesday and Wednesday with temperatures trending back down into the 60s for the beginning of next week. All right, take a look at your weather wow moment of the day. Chris, this is something. Overnight rain caused a massive tree to fall on some power lines in Monroe. 11 Alive storm tracker Carla Self took this picture. She sent us these photos. She says that tree was so big that it blocked off an entire street. I'll tell you what, the good news in this, nobody was injured. 
You know, oftentimes when we see these trees that big fall on a home, there's always a, an unhappy and tragic story to report. But the good news, it didn't hit anybody. But man, that is a big tree. We want to see your weather moments. And the easiest way to share them is on the 11 Alive Storm Trackers Facebook group. So request to join the group right now. And it's a lot of fun. And Chris will be looking for your pictures. Coming up after the break, she still doesn't know if she has the virus. We speak with a woman who has been waiting more than a week for her results. Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, I sent my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm -hmm. yeah, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, I've got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, okay. yeah. right, right. about I mean, that. Reward would be... Slimming. Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A little water yes. in my cup. And and beautiful skin. <laughs> well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning rush, weekdays, five to seven AM. Only on eleven alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the rush blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the rush block on the morning rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. A Brasselton woman still does not know if she has the virus or not. She says that she was told she would have results in 24 to 72 hours, but she says that that just hasn't happened as of yet. Elvin Lopez has her story tonight. You are dealing with, you know, 10, 15, 20 people that I came in contact with that are out there that have no idea whether they are COVID-19 positive or negative. It's been nine days since Rosa Santiago Zimmerman says she was tested for COVID-19 curbside at North Georgia Urgent Care in Brazelton. Today, she still doesn't know whether she has the novel virus. The 49-year-old with no underlying medical condition says she's been feeling sick for three weeks now, and it all started during a Florida business trip. I just have this hacking cough, and sometimes this cough will last for like 30 seconds where I'm just coughing, 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 and the burning sensation in my lungs. Now she remains in self-quarantine with her husband and daughter, who also have been showing symptoms. I was told that they cannot be tested until my results come in. On Monday, she says she got a call saying her test results came in as negative, but then another call saying that wasn't the case. My physician called me back to tell me that they had made a mistake that my results were pending and had not arrived yet. Now she's in limbo. We keep on talking about let's flatten this curve. Well, we can't flatten the curve if we don't have the information to flatten the curve. National health officials say the U.S. is seeing more cases of COVID-19 in people between the ages 
of 20 and 54. In Georgia, the Department of Public Health says 60 percent of cases are within the 18 to 59 age range. 35 percent are over 60. The majority of deaths in Georgia are those over the age of 60. The coronavirus is taking a major toll on our day-to-day -day lives. A former regional director of FEMA says this pandemic is the largest disaster our nation has ever faced. Hear more from him coming up next. Context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together our voices grow. Together we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they yeah. would wait the next week. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, and Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Auntie. No. <laughs> Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hat. Let's get you caught up on the very latest developments in the coronavirus pandemic as of seven o'clock tonight. It's about three and a half hours ago. The state health department reports there are a total of 1,387 confirmed cases. 47 people have died. So stop what you're doing. Take a look at the graphic on your screen. You can see that COVID-19 cases have now hit 97 of Georgia's 159 counties. And among those who have lost their lives, the result of this awful pandemic is a beloved coach and teacher at Mount Vernon School here in Atlanta. 11 Alive, she knew her, spoke to Mr. Hill's daughter. 
Those closest to Ron Hill say he was a staple at the Mount Vernon School. The 63-year-old coach and teacher made a difference on the field and in the classroom. There is not a person that has come into contact with Ron that would have anything negative to say about him, ever. Um, he was the kind of person that if you needed him, he was there. Nikki Williams Rucker is Hill's family friend and former colleague at the school. She says her family is heartbroken over his death, and so is Hill's daughter, Kendria Hill, who says she misses him badly. Daddy is a fun-loving, no-nonsense kind of man. Kendria says her father went to the hospital for pneumonia in both lungs, but his condition got worse after testing positive for COVID-19. With his other underlying health issues, it was just, um, it was just hard to deal with, hard to process that, you know, this virus is real. It hit close to home. The Mount Vernon School said in a statement, Ron Hill was a longtime beloved teacher and coach at the Mount Vernon School. His passing is an incredible loss for our community, impacting so many of us. Ron Hill impacted so many lives at Mount Vernon. It is an incredible tragedy for that community and everybody who knew him. We want to pass along our condolences. The former Southeast Regional Director of FEMA says the coronavirus is the largest disaster to ever face this nation. He told our Caitlin Ross it is going to require the entire country pulling together to defeat it. This kind of a disaster, a biomedical disaster, is a different kind of a disaster. John Copenhaver responded to hurricanes, tornadoes and wildfires during his time at FEMA under President Clinton's administration, but says he never dealt with anything like COVID-19. The president named FEMA as the lead response agency. It needs to be really FEMA working very, very closely with the National Institutes for Health, the Centers for Disease Control and uh, medical authorities. He thinks the response needs to be more unified than what we see now in Georgia, with different cities and counties declaring their own individual state of emergencies, which can widely vary. If one area effectively responds, but other areas that are within a certain geographical distance don't, then you could have a, a problem with people coming to the area that didn't respond as effectively into the area that managed to, con to somewhat contain the virus and starting the cycle all over again. He thinks the United States should learn from countries that got the virus under control quickly, like South Korea, where they had more immediate widespread testing and isolating people who are sick. Since March 11th, they've seen a general decline in new cases. What did they do and do effectively? Copenhaver believes the United States response now will be effective, though it may have taken too long to get here. Lag time in between things getting worse, which has happened so quickly with this virus, and the spin-up of, of government operations to be able to respond is causing some degree of fear and frustration. But they need to know that there really are world-class people that are a part of this response effort. And on the subject of government and the government's response to all of this, 11 Alive Cheryl Preheim spoke with Governor Kemp earlier today, and he says that there is some distinct differences between what we are experiencing in Georgia now and what has transpired in South Korea. You know, what we're doing is we're just dealing with the situation or the hand that we were dealt. Uh, if we had more testing, you know, we could be testing everybody, and as we got positives, we could you know, order those folks to be in self-quarantine at their homes like was done in South Korea. But we're just not at that point. So there's no need in wasting time trying to do that. We just have to, to do uh, the best we can. There are so many moving parts of this pandemic. You can talk about government. You can talk about economics. You can talk about the, the medical dimension, as we saw with Ron Hill, who uh, tragically has lost his life in the middle of this. And, and then there is the issue of parents and children and the interaction at home now as parents are now finding themselves uh, involved with their children in ways that they did not anticipate. They have become teacher, they have become coach, they have become therapist, they have become shepherd. They make sure that everything is taken care of. Here's Rebecca Lindstrom who spent some time with two mothers as they are trying to figure out this new normal. Comprehensive worksheet. We met Ashley Mahoney's family on the first week schools closed. Life seemed pretty well under control. The most challenging right now is making sure that 
By the end of the week, we still have the same momentum. By week two, momentum remains intact, but the challenges of getting stuff done are more apparent, like the three-year-old running in the background, turning on and off the lights. It's given this mom a valuable lesson. Accepting that it's not going to be perfect and learning to roll with punches. Mahoney says her son is diligent about his homework, but it doesn't all make it to the teachers. Connor's concerned. Worrying about getting bad grades. Can you tell her? Mahoney has worries too. She's had to step away from at least one important web meeting for work. Cece had just had enough. And, you know, she wouldn't sit. She was crying. She, I mean, she, she was done. When I asked Mahoney how she was feeling. Trying to be upbeat for my kids. That look really says it all, and it's about the same look I got from this mom. My oldest and Courtney Gibbs has a seven-year-old son with special needs. Aiden is pre-verbal. He's just learning to talk and doesn't really understand what's going on. He went from having a very busy schedule, school all day, and then therapy after school. And we were doing seven therapies a week. That's now down to three. So that goes. Gibbs hopes those programs are able to stay open. She needs the support and Aiden needs the interaction. We are seeing some behavior that we have not seen in a very long time come back. Some aggression. Gibbs tries to keep him busy with the things he loves. <laughs> Disney music, playing outdoors. It's tough for him to sit down and focus on a computer-based lesson. And her older son? He is an IEP as well. So he's running around, he's loud, he's happy. And then my oldest is upstairs like, Mom, I need help. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And I'm like, I don't know what to do, you know, because I feel like I'm being pulled in every direction. Despite the challenges, both moms say the time with their children is priceless. You know, maybe incorporate some cooking or, you know, just more talks. And, you know, because, I, you know, we never have time for just those simple things. And there have been successes, too. We've been able to potty train in our house. This is a huge deal. I've heard from a lot of parents that it's the uncertainty that is really the hardest part, not knowing just what to tell your kids. And these moms say they certainly agree. Yeah, parenting is never easy, even in the best of times. But this is something totally different. Grocery store staffers play a vital part in helping us get food on the table and the supplies that we need. But how are they managing and what can we do to ensure that everybody is safe when they are shopping? An estimated three million people in the United States make their living in the grocery business. And right now, in addition to our health care workers and first responders, these are people that are up front every day dealing with the public and certainly they are at risk. Here's NBC's Vicki Wynn with more. In the midst of shutdowns and social distancing, grocery store clerks are seeing a sustained spike in demand as shoppers stock up for a pandemic. Sales have gone up tremendously and uh, customers are just coming in and buying up uh, product at unseen levels. Jared Labar usually works in the corporate office for King Supermarkets, but now he's in stores helping to restock. Is there anything that people can do to help all of these workers who are on the front lines? The biggest thing for us is, the, you know, just make sure that they are adhering to the social distancing. To keep that distance and protect workers from the constant flow of customers, Albertsons, HEB and Kroger are installing plexiglass shields in the checkout line. Just remember that we're human beings too and we have feelings and yeah, just take care of us too because we're taking care of them. Workers asking customers to be patient and understanding when items are sold out. Despite assurances that the supply chain is working, some stores continue to report gaps in what they normally provide. We're actually out of ground turkey at the moment. Still, essential items are available thanks to staff providing some normalcy during an abnormal time. Somebody's got to be here. I mean, people need food. There's some things you can live without. Food is not one of them. And on social media, a flood of appreciation in the form of art like this. Workers hailed as heroes and thanked by many for being brave. This banner hung across the street from a store in Brooklyn. Thanks for the groceries. We love you. They're really awesome. And to be here, like during this time, during this time period where it's really tough, it, it takes a brave person. With data showing the average grocery store worker makes $29,000 a year, these staffers are working overtime to provide basic services to keep society running. 
Well, I don't consider myself a hero. Karen, a cashier from New Jersey, tells us she's just doing her job. It's our job to make sure that you have what you need. So next time you see your cashier, just say thank you. It means a lot. Yesterday's pollen count was only 19, and as we dried out a little bit, it's now back up to 664. We have a drier, warmer weather pattern ahead. We'll let you know what this could do to the pollen count over the next few days. Coming up, could more changes be coming for the sports calendar? What's the latest with the AJC Peachtree Road Race? We'll find out coming up next in sports. Good guys do finish last. Mm. Oh, I You're consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've nice got guy. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh. Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. okay. right, right. about I mean, that. Well, reward would be... Slimming down. Okay. Yes. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, a little water yes. in my cup. And and beautiful skin. Well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin. You know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. It's not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush weekdays, five to seven a.m. Only on Eleven Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Blog on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your Morning Rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel is good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more. With a shortage of masks continuing, many of you have asked us about making your own at home. And we had our Verify team look into this to see what is truth and what is not. Again, you see so much on the internet, so much in social media about whether this is effective or not. Here's our Jason Puckett. Viewer Ann P sent us a question about making protective masks. She'd seen instructions online and wanted to know if they worked. And Ann is definitely not alone. There are a lot of articles about this right now. So let's break this down. Can you make your own masks? 
Do they work? And when should you even be wearing a mask? Our sources, the WHO and CDC. So one reason this question is gaining steam online is that people are posting patterns and encouraging others to make the masks. This Forbes article says, quote, if you think that handmade masks can't be used, think again. Even the CDC has a place for them in times of crisis like the one we're in right now. So this is technically true, but it needs some context. The CDC does have a page dedicated to optimizing the supply of face masks. They have different recommendations based on conventional, contingency, and crisis situations. And all the way at the bottom of the page, below crisis situations, there's an important point about using homemade masks. The CDC says these should be a last resort, only used with other protective measures, and that their ability to protect healthcare workers is unknown. Basically, the CDC says they don't know if homemade masks are effective and should only be used when nothing else is available. The WHO agrees with that. They say that medical masks should only be worn if you're caring for a sick person or if you yourself are coughing or sneezing. WHO guidelines say that cloth masks, like cotton or gauze, are not recommended under any circumstances. And most of home patterns call for using cloth of some sort. So we can verify, neither the CDC or WHO recommend using homemade masks. Got any other questions? Send us an email. As this whole pandemic has begun to spread out in so many places in the United States, there are those who are not feeling the effects of illness who want to do something. They want to contribute in any way that they possibly can. And one local woman had a wish to help, and now she has turned that into nearly 500 Chick-fil-A sandwiches for doctors and nurses and those who are in hospitals looking out for those who are ill. These are uh, uh, really a great story of a woman who is doing above and beyond. Hey friends, it's Cecily and Rachel. Um, and Rachel had a brilliant idea a couple days ago that we should go to Chick-fil-A and take some sandwiches to some of our local hospitals. It all came from me feeling really overwhelmed and scared and wanting to help people. People started sharing it on social media and it just took on a life of its own, really. Friends, we're at Northside Hospital. We're about to load up all the Chick-fil-A sandwiches and take them inside. So let's see what we find. Because I'm up to almost 500 sandwiches. Wow. At first, they think we're just bringing them like a couple meals, you know, but when then they see it's hundreds of sandwiches, they have just been so appreciative. All right, friends, that is a wrap for our Chick-fil-A delivery. Thanks so much for coming along with us. Uh, thank you for everybody that donated your points. You just uh, be kind to each other and help each other. It's not that hard to love your neighbor like yourself. Take a look at the ups and downs that we've been dealing with with the pollen count so far this week. Remember on Sunday when that pollen count was at 2462? That was the highest that we've been so far this year. And I say so far because we're still going to get most likely higher than that before we get to the peak of the season, which is most likely going to be at the beginning of April. Monday, we went down to 594. That's thanks to some rain and some cooler air that came in. And then Tuesday's number was down to 19. That's because of the rain that came in on Monday into early on Tuesday really washed it out a little bit. We had some breaks in the action, and that allowed the pollen count to come back up to 664 today. And I think that trend of rising pollen numbers is going to continue over the next few days because it is going to be very dry out there and it's also going to be warm and that's just going to make that pollen spread and explode a little bit more. Look at that high today, 73. Average high for this time of year is 67. And we picked up about uh, just a little bit more than a half inch of rain overnight. But look at that surplus now almost back up to 13 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. We're going to be dry for the next few days. That's going to be nice for us. Mostly sunny Thursday, a high of 78, warming into the 80s Friday and Saturday. A few more clouds Friday and then increasing clouds on Saturday before we get some scattered showers Sunday, dry Monday before more scattered showers return for Tuesday and Wednesday. Oh, I assume the mom had uh, COVID-19. They were just explaining to me that she had to be put on a ventilator. Please protect your families, your, 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 your loved ones. Your friends, yourself. We're going to beat it. We're going to win. Carl Anthony Towns of the Timberwolves releasing that emotional video today. His mother is fighting coronavirus. She is struggling, and he is wanting everybody to make sure that they protect themselves against this awful pandemic. We wish him and his family well. So in the sports world, so much is unsettled right now. You wonder about 
What's going to happen specifically here in Atlanta about the Peachtree Road Race, the AJC Peachtree Road Race, which, of course, is July 4th. And the race director is Rich Kana, and he spoke with Alex Glaze today about where they stand and where they may be going. The Atlanta Track Club is preparing for the 51st running of the Peachtree Road Race. But this year, the planning process has been different. Our staff is getting intimately familiar with Google Hangout. There are roughly 35 people working on the plan for the peach tree, and all of them are following the recommendations and guidelines the city of Atlanta has in place to fight the coronavirus. The Atlanta Track Club is planning full steam ahead with the understanding that things might not go as planned. There is nothing off the table. Uh, in our planning process for 2020. In these times of uncertainty, uh, we have to plan for everything. Planning for everything includes postponement and cancellation of the race. In the previous 50 consecutive runnings of the peach tree, there has never been a cancellation or postponement. The race has always happened on the 4th of July. This year, with health and safety on the minds of almost everybody, the most important thing is ensuring that everything is safe for the world's largest 10K. Our mission is about health and fitness. Um, so we won't have this event uh, if there's any doubt of, about our ability to deliver it in, in a safe manner on July 4th. Georgia Tech started their spring football at the beginning of the month, but now everyone's at home. Jeff Collins can only do so much with his players and can only suggest workouts. His coaches have been posting their workouts on Twitter, as you see here. He told us today how he and his staff are handling coaching by proxy. We're allowed to provide them workouts, uh, provide them things that they should do without using any equipment ne necessary. Um, and our guys, you know, follow those things. But I think the cool thing, we have such a young, energetic uh, and in shape coaching staff that our coaches do the workouts too. Jeff has not altered his routine. He is still getting up at 4 a.m. This Jeff will not be getting up at 4 a.m. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. This is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. <laughs> News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever-changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel is good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're going to get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must-see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they happens. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a new yeah. way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headline.
We have a dry pattern for the next few days, mostly sunny skies here tomorrow. High temperatures up to 78 degrees, 84 on Friday with a couple more clouds around and then more clouds build in Saturday before some showers arrive. Scattered stuff on Sunday. It's not a washout though. Dry again on Monday before scattered showers return again Tuesday and Wednesday when we cool back down into the 60s. Jeff. All right, Chris, thank you. That's it from my house tonight. Have a great evening, everybody. Up late on 11 Alive goes right now. 11alive.com, your place for news all day and all nights. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. newscast not enough for you get even more at 11 alive's youtube channel where you'll find uncut interviews extended body cam footage live streams of atlanta's biggest trials and more subscribe to 11 alive today babe where are my keys uh, where's my lunch where's my phone hey where's my blue shirt where's my pen have you seen it Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, away. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, auntie. No. <laughs> auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news. From 11 Alive News, up late starts now. Right now, Congress is burning the midnight oil trying to get checks to the American people. They are voting right now on a spending package. We're going to break down the process in just six minutes. This comes as the nation tries.